Hello, welcome to the best of the day here at the 14th International Myeloma Workshop. I'm Dr. Sagar Loniel from Emory University, and today I'm joined with Professor Gareth Morgan from the Royal Marsden and the International Cancer Research. Professor Morgan? Hi, it's uh, nice to be here with you, Saga. It's always a pleasure to, to meet up and talk with you. All right, so today we're going to talk about genomics and new information presented at the workshop. So let's talk about some things that can impact the way we think clinically about patients. So I'm always struck by, um, we, we know that there are kind of multiple different outcomes for patients with, with myeloma, some kind of a very indolent clinical course and some, no matter what you do with them, don't respond and progress rapidly. And so I think the, the way forward with this problem because it is a problem mm -hmm. clinically, is going to be using genomics. And, and that's really what, what I'm interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of, I know about the technology, but y you need to use this technology to actually solve something that's clinically meaningful. Yeah, so the, there are lots of different ways, for instance, that we're defining high risk in mm -hmm. 2012. There's simple things like ISS staging, FISH. Mm. Uh, there's now the availability of GEP profiles uh, for commercial use, mm. sequencing, all these things. How, how should clinicians think about trying to integrate some of this data into the way they approach patients? So um, I think you should always ask um, the, the question about what is it that the test is meant to answer. And um, the TC classification where you mm -hmm take genomic information, gene expression information, and come up with, say, six different biological groups is one important way that you can split myeloma up. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in you know, the, the 414 group, which is 15% of the total. It expresses a, a, a novel gene, MM set. MM sets are an H3K36 methyl-2 transferase. Mm -hmm. And it's the A's bit, I think, that's important, because if you're an enzyme, you can be inhibited. Right. So designing drugs that inhibit that is a way forward. And that, if you think of diagnosis and uh, outcome in that case, that's a predictive test, because your drug will only work for mm -hmm. that translocation. Right. And the other side of the coin is the risk stratified treatment. Mm -hmm. And there, I, I think there, there has been a lot of progress. I kind of like these kind of fish-based methods. Mm -hmm. And we kind of presented data around kind of counting up the number of abnormalities. So mm -hmm. rather than saying 17 P minus is, you know, a poor prognostic factor, right. we'd like to say, you know, a 414 plus 17 P minus ultra high risk, mm -hmm. you should really think carefully about how you treat those mm -hmm. patients. And, and so in order to make those decisions, you need information quickly. Um, and I, I like the idea of thinking about what you want to do mm. with the test. Do you want to define the type of myeloma a patient has, yeah, right. or do you want to define their risk? Mm. I guess that's really what you're talking about. Yes. So how would one, um, how, would, how would you apply that to a patient you see in the clinic then? So. Um, yeah, because we work in the, the UK and um, you have to be very aware of the cost of healthcare mm -hmm. interventions. And so um, traditionally we've done a panel of fish tests. Mm -hmm. So we'll do translocations, 17P, 1Q, 1P, um, which gives you all of the prognostic information right. that you need. You can replace that by a simple PCR-based mm -hmm. test. So we've done some work around generating an RT-PCR that will tell you all of the groups of the TC classification, mm -hmm. and then you do fish for 17P and 1Q. Mm -hmm. So that's one very simple way forward, I think. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. And then there's the other, which is the use of gene expression mm -hmm. profiling in the clinical arena. Right. And as you know, I mean, the number of sites in America kind of pushing this, this forward for the world. Mm -hmm. I still, when I talk to my guys in the routine lab, they, they make a lot of kind of issues around quality control, mm -hmm. data analysis, reliability of the test, sensitivity and specificity. Mm -hmm. 
and these all play heavily in, into whether you, you choose to go with a test or not. Overall, though, I think the future will involve some sort of gene expression profiling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's an interesting idea, the idea that if you take a single sample and you run it twice with a five-minute interval between times, how consistent is that number from a GEP done in a lab? Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, and there's a normalization process that right. goes on. I've done, yeah, done lots of work with this, and it, it's actually the, the normalization algorithms that you use. Mm -hmm. How do you take a single experiment, normalize it, compare to a set of historical controls, group that patient as either high or low risk? Mm -hmm. Do you use the Arkansas score, the IFM score, the German score, the British right. score? then if there's discrepancies between the two, which inevitably there will, mm -hmm. where do you assign the patient? And um, these are all yeah, interesting problems. I, I think they can be overcome. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about buying a test, that's what you, you need to ask, as well as will it identify all patients who have a bad risk? Mm -hmm but also what percentage of people who don't have a poor risk will the test identify? I see, yeah. Do you see what I mean? That yeah. if you find 20% of people that have good risk within your group mm -hmm. overall, so a, an 80% specificity, mm -hmm. if you up the ante with your treatment and say you're going to do allotransplant for mm -hmm. all those people, actually you're going to take 20% of people arguably overtreat them mm -hmm. and maybe impair their overall outcome right and this is the kind of the real clinical issues that you, you you need to consider so you know the other thing that you mentioned in the original concept here uh, that's been discussed at this meeting is the idea that um, while myeloma is unified by a single name it is not a single disease no, and that's a separate discussion from risk Right. Yeah, so that's uh, this is a um, like I'm loving this as a, an idea because I, I think if we use this a, approach in a kind of intelligent way, mm -hmm. that will make a lot of progress and improve the outcome for lots of patients. Mm -hmm. So the idea is precision medicine. So mm -hmm. you take a diagnostic, and I think probably the the best example now is BRAF mutations. They're present 4% of right. the time. Um, it's not a poor prognostic mm -hmm. feature. It, it's simply there. But there are BRAF inhibitors. And so if you have the V600E mutation, it seems to me now that there are three patients in the world who've been described, mm -hmm. who've had kind of end-stage myeloma, have had a V600E mutation, had the BRAF inhibitor responded mm -hmm. and have done well, so what this tells you is, is not that targeting BRAF is the be all and end all going forward. It's that we should think about myeloma in a different way, split it up, mm -hmm. use the genomics to identify individual groups of patients that have pathways that are activated that can be targeted mm -hmm. or specific mutations that can be targeted. And by taking that approach, combining it with traditional or novel therapies as, as we've already discussed, right. I think we can Im improve things dramatically. So you can identify BRAF without necessarily doing sequencing or other tests along yeah, the Yeah, there are simple um, in vitro diagnostics right. for the V600E mutation that will pick up all of the mutations and it's an inexpensive test and you know, currently we're we're trying to screen as many people as we can mm -hmm. to increase uh, recruitment in, into our trial. Right. Um, so four percent of the total, you know, it, it's you know you have to screen four hundred people to get a limited number of right. patients. So in that same sense, there is certainly data from the leukemia world that BRAF is it leukemia? It might be leukemia. That BRAF mutations, if with associated NRAS or KRAS mutations may have differing effects on response and outcomes. Um, so um, I, I think the examples are around 
BRAF in melanoma, mm -hmm. which responds. Um, colon cancer is not responding. Right. And so the presence of the mutation will have different impacts dependent upon the tissue background mm -hmm. it occurs in. The other thing about these um, targeted treatment precision medicine strategies is the issue of intraclonal heterogeneity. Right. And so there are these like important concepts about the way cancers develop. And basically you get complex early in the disease, so at the mugus stage, mm -hmm. and then they evolve with branching truncal structures. So you have a complex trunk and then branches. Mm -hmm. So you can have a mutation present in 20% of the cells. If you target that, there is very little clinical impact. Mm -hmm. If it's a truncal mutation and it occurred early in the course of the disease, of course you target it rather than pruning the tree, you kill the tree by taking out right. its roots really. And so it's a, so it sounds like a fatuous I idea, but it's actually very, very important and will underlie a lot of the progress that we'll need to make uh, in the next few years about diagnostic tests, mm -hmm. what mutations do we look for, can you do a testing strategy during um, maintenance? Say we had a, an interesting debate about maintenance. Mm -hmm. If you could take a biopsy or a sample every six months, mm -hmm. subject that to a molecular diagnostic test, when clones were evolving early on before they'd become complex, you might be able to intervene, totally eradicate that clone uh, and yeah. prevent it growing out and right. leading to a, a relapse. So these are kind of futuristic, mm -hmm. but the way the technology is moving, I mean, I, I think in the next few years, they'll become very much a reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may actually be able to get that from the blood. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So circulating so, DNA. You know, circulating tumor cells in mm -hmm. prostate cancer, right. you, you, you can do these tests on, and uh, you know, in, in myeloma, why, mm -hmm. why shouldn't you be able to, to do something similar? Yeah. So the clonal heterogeneity question has really sort of thrown the, the field of, I won't say for a loop so much, but you know, there are the two schools of thought about um, less intensive therapy versus more intensive therapy. How do you think the clonal heterogeneity really falls into those, to that debate, which is an active debate now, I think. So um, it's not, so, so for me, it, it's not about intensive versus less mm -hmm. intensive. Um, it's about historical lessons as well, that mm -hmm. you should always use combinations of drugs. If you use a single agent, you get a response, but the cancer manages to evade right. that. So, right. um, you know, there's good examples from lymphoma world for drug combinations. Mm -hmm. um, the other important thing is that sometimes the treatment you use at presentation can drive the acquisition of mutations mm -hmm. and deleterious mutations that appear later in the disease course. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we're making significant progress with the treatment of myeloma. People are kind of living a long time. Mm -hmm. So should you avoid mutagens in your treatment strategy? Mm -hmm. So should we be moving towards non-chemotherapy-driven regimes? And while I can make a strong academic argument for it, it still seems to me that autologous transplantation for a good proportion of patients is the optimum treatment mm -hmm. and that we use novel agents to improve the outcome. But you can see a day when autologous transplantation will no longer be the treatment of choice. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, and, and I think certainly for most patients when you do an autograft, they're in a lower disease burden, so hopefully you're exposing fewer yeah. cells, right? So like, I, I'm glad you said that. Because it, it's a very important concept that we learned from CML that if you reduce the number of cells from, say you'd reduce it by four logs or mm -hmm. five logs, the fewer cells that are at risk of getting a mutation, the less chance there is of the disease progressing. Right, and right, um, right. You know, ag again, that's a historical lesson, I think. So how in the, in the UK, in your, in your mm. trials or in your mm. patients that you see off study, 
are you putting this all together for a patient? So a newly diagnosed patient walks in to see you, 55 years old, uh, what kind of information do you need to be able to make a decision on treatment if they're not going to go on a study? That's a, that's a, a really important um, question. And currently, we're using um, fish-based strategies mm -hmm. and these diagnostic PCRs. There's a, a, a really important nihilistic argument mm -hmm. in all of this, which is if you're not going to treat the disease differently, why would you do the test? Mm -hmm. And what I think we're starting to see is that there is a rationale for treating the disease differently. Mm -hmm. And it's that sort of information that from this type of meeting that allows change to happen so that across a country or a continent as a whole, people suddenly see the benefit of risk stratification mm -hmm. and altering the treatment paradigms. And so I'm a great believer that we should customize the treatment to the risk status of the patient. Um, and, and the time for doing this is, is now, I think. So you, you would change the initial induction? You would change the consolidation? You would change the maintenance? You would change them all? Because oh. so, um, I'll tell you ours after. after yeah, no, go. it's kind of really um, important because... Um, like if you run a study in a number of centers, there's an issue of turnaround of test. Right. So you need the information, a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And currently, there can be four weeks, maybe even longer delay in having the risk stratification information. Right. And if somebody's got you know, poor risk disease, you don't want to just watch them until you've got the results. So there's right. going to be some induction treatment mm -hmm. to give yourself chance to get the test back. But then I, 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 I think what I'm keen on, on doing is doing clinical trials based on in individual groups. So I'd like to see 414 specific trials, um, mm -hmm. 1114 trials, mm -hmm. and then based on risk status. And I think you can make both arguments. You, I think there is a rationale currently for increasing the the intensity of treatment for high risk. Mm -hmm. um, but I know you're going to tell me that you can make an argument to decrease the intensity for the, the same group on the grounds that they're more genomically unstable. And it's this sort of question that I think I really get a buzz out of coming right. to me where I can talk to you and kind of just just debate it really yeah yeah I mean I, you're right and, and I guess I wouldn't call our approach less intensive because we give three years of maintenance therapy but uh, there's certainly less alkylator that's less, the, yeah. that's very much the point yeah, so yeah. Um, mutagen free treatment right, 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 right. and um, combinations which which is the, the point about genomic like heterogeneity. mutagen free treatment MFT <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be the buzzword in memory <laughs> All right, so what other things did you see or hear at this meeting that you think are gonna help us take the next steps? Because I think the technology's phenomenal. The question is, how do we use it? So there hasn't been much in the meeting about um, diagnostic strategies, mm -hmm. and um, that's actually probably a deficit. I, I think we really should be talking about what's the way of, or let's rephrase that, we should be talking about how does the patient benefit from this sort of genomic right. advance, because you know we've got next generation sequencing, next generation sequencing approaches that can look at all known genomic abnormalities for very little money, turn around times really quickly. What we should be asking is, how can we get a myeloma specific test to a patient population, right. then treat them based on that test? Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge for us doctors, I think, that patient input really helps us to understand. Yeah, and you, I know, do a lot of work with the patient groups in the UK. Mm. What do you think their, um, you know, patients certainly in the US will come saying, I want this test done or I want that test done. Is uh, genomic sequencing and all those kinds of things on the radar? So um, your, your question was very pertinent for me because you said, what do you actually do now? And what I've been in the process of doing and of just about completed mm -hmm. is to be able to provide a set of 
kind of diagnostics that will put patients into a TC group, give you a risk stratification signature, mm -hmm. and we're going to set guidelines in place which will lead to us treating low-risk patients, not non-intensively, but in one way, and the high-risk patients differently. And I think that strategy really is going to give dividends in a few years time and I know you agree with that because I'm pretty much sure that's what you're doing <laughs> currently <laughs> <laughs> yep that sounds good that sounds good all yeah. right any other any other abstracts that caught your eye or that you want to discuss no I I, th I think we've um, discussed most of the kind of genomic areas that uh, came up at the meeting and it's been been a pleasure talking to you and thank thanks for inviting me to come along absolutely great Thank you for joining us today on Best of the Day, and join us next with Dr. Olowski, where we'll be talking about relapsed and refractory disease updates from the Myeloma Workshop. Thank you.